In 1927, after the disastrous northern expedition and the death of our leader Chiang Kai-shek, the Kuomintang was split up. Its legitimacy turned abysmal and its forces were destroyed. But we still remain in the fight. Under Song Shigling, an insurrection is being fought in Mingang. And in Europe, with the help of the Third International, a sizable exile organization has been established under Wang Jingwei with the support of the left wing of the party. There is a clear rivalry between these two groups as their final vision for China has changed, but we still fight together to re-establish the Kuomintang in China. Currently, with the Qing government dominating China, we see no way to expand our resistance and liberate the Chinese peasants and workers. But fracturing and economic mismanagement might turn our hopeless situation to one full of opportunity. In Mingang, the League of Eight Provinces have tried their best to encircle and destroy our insurrection. While they are getting more effective at stopping important supply shipments from sympathizers and isolate our resistance cell, it is too late. After the Germans bought all major railway companies in the region, securing their dominance and forcing Chinese managers and stakeholders to surrender their power, the long-suffering Chinese people have spread the sparks of resistance like wildfire. While the exiled syndicalists and radical socialists are trying to take advantage of this, the real beneficiary are the Mingang insurrection and its wing inside the party. The resistance and protests against the Imperial Germany and the government in Nanjing reached new heights after the horrific news of them massacring 200 striking workers and wounding another 800 spread throughout the region. Additionally, with the capitalist economy collapsing in Germany and its economic shockwaves hurting all capitalist nations, especially those reliant on Germany, the time is ripe for an end to the League of Eight Provinces and for us to take over. With the shattering of the Qing Empire, we launched our revolt with 40,000 men in Lower Minjiang. It will be a difficult fight, but we must succeed, and luckily we aren't fighting alone. While we are at war with the Anqing clique, we currently have no borders, so we can both focus on defeating the Nanjing government. Currently, we have three initial goals. Secure access to the sea by capturing a port. This will allow the exiles in Europe to return and the Third International to send support. And the two others are to take control over Ganan Prefecture and Fujian Province. We quickly started moving to secure all three. With the government and army in Nanjing being in complete disarray, we could capture Guangzhou without resistance and even start moving north towards Nanhang. On the eastern front, they tried their best to defend the port in Chaimen, but with their laughable organization, we seized the city and its port as well as the neighboring city of Guangzhou. All our three objectives are now achieved and with the return of the exiles and support from the international soon arriving our morale is unbreakable. Additionally we have started turning our insurrection forces into the second national revolutionary army and raising several new forces. While there had been minimal battle previously, the Nanjing army started arriving and attacking. In Nanshang they had encircled the city and tried to enter it again. However, we counterattacked from the west and encircled one of their divisions. This, for some reason, prompted a massive retreat of the Nanjing forces to the east, allowing us to capture the rest of Yuzhang state. With the international volunteers starting an offensive in the west at the same time and it being victorious, we overwhelmed our enemy and started advancing in all directions. Any divisions who weren't fast enough to retreat were encircled. In the east, four of them were. This only thinned out their defenses even more, granting them no chance to stop our offensive. As our troops marched along the East China Sea, they soon arrived in Hangzhou. Fearing execution upon our troops reaching Nanjing, the clique leaders fled the country or surrendered to us. So, the Nanjing clique have been defeated and our troops have entered Nanjing. But the war isn't over, the Anquin clique still have to be crushed. Additionally, a second contender has claimed Nanjing, the Shandong clique under Zhang Zongshang. While we aren't at war yet, our leadership have decided to declare it since our march north was such a success. 
To supply this invasion, we've started raising militias back in Mingang as well as raising men loyal to our cause in our newly captured areas. But before we can march on Yinan, Anku and Klik have to be defeated. The offensive started simple, they hadn't their troops on the front line, so we managed to advance all the way to the Yangtze River. We even managed to cross it in the west. However, their forces have now arrived and set up strong defenses on the other side of it. So instead of trying to attack over it, we turned to the north where we had already crossed the river a lot. While we did, the government also announced that Nanjing would be our new capital. In the north, the concentration of enemy troops was much smaller, allowing our troops to encircle their forces. With several extra troops arriving to aid in the offensive, we started moving both towards the most northern city and to the west to split it off from Anqing city. Both of the offensives were successful, so successful in fact we could attack Anqing itself both from the south and the north. Despite Feng Tiang volunteers aiding in its defenses, we had eventually cleared the city out of resistance and the Anqing leadership surrendered. While most of them and their generals fled to either Feng Tiang or the Qing government, a small group of young officers with Sun Li Ren at the helm asked to join us. While the totalists like them to be executed, their anti-imperialism and youthful enthusiasm will serve us well. Back to the war, we only have to defeat Shandong. Since they weren't ready for us arriving, we could capture two of their border cities. However, one got lost after their forces started arriving. But for some reason, they left the city so that we could take it back and encircle one of the divisions as well as a Japanese volunteer force. After a while they were destroyed and we continued north. Easily breaking through, Jaidong state was captured and all that was left was Jinan where we had pushed their forces into a corner. With us winning every single battle, Zhang Zongshang fled the country and as we captured Jinan, his forces surrendered as well. So, the war is now over, but while our goal is to continue and spread the revolution to all of China, there are several things we need to do before we can. Our newly captured states must be integrated, our industry must be recovered and our legitimacy must be strengthened for us to succeed. So to begin the work we hosted the first repatriated congress of the Kuomintang. Together Wang Jingwei's Reorganized Comrades Association or the RCA and Song Qingling, leader of the Mingang Insurrection and the Provisional Action Committee or PAC, have agreed that the Kuomintang should be a party for the workers and peasants of China. Currently, cooperation is strong between the two factions due to none of them having a majority. This is because there are several other minor factions such as the syndicalists, totalists and social liberals. However, in the shadows a fight for power is still ongoing between the RCA and the PAC. During the Congress, a temporary constitution was agreed upon following Sun Yat-sen's principles. This meant establishing the legislative yuan and the national bureaucracy. Starting with the yuan, it is it who will make new laws. While the RCA was the biggest faction in it, the PAC fearing that they would be able to exert total control as they also have the post of chairman founded an alliance with some syndicalists and the social liberals to gain a majority in the Yuan strengthening all three factions. Then, with the establishment of the national bureaucracy and the passing of the 1936 organic law, the social liberals and the PAC's strength grew even more. Both these reforms have largely improved our legitimacy and we are slowly starting to integrate our territories. To hurry up the process, Zhang Bojun and Shi Kotong have reached out to the masses and started short-term projects to help them out and strengthen integration. We have now decided to start economic reconstruction by appeasing the Western syndicalists through a united front with the Chinese syndicalists who are getting a lot of support from them. This has allowed us to nationalize the railway, redistribute warlord assets and focusing the gains on the people. We also start developing the Mingang region as well as creating the Ministry of Communications with the ultimate goal of a national broadcasting service. However, before we finished our economic reforms, we've decided to slowly start to prepare for the unification of China. This meant reinforcing the foreign ministry to achieve international recognition. 
Before we started reinforcing our army as well, we restored the political department. The department that has made every soldier and officer dedicated and loyal to the Kuimintang's cause. Finally, the Wampua Military Academy was reopened, but it isn't as simple as that since the political combat has spread to it as well. The new guard, supported by the RCA, are advocating for a more modern approach, copying the French and British. While the old guard, those who fought in the Mingang insurrection and are members of the PAC are advocating for the army to follow the legacy of the insurrection. After endless debates in the high command, the PAC intervened, having gained significant political power and popularity all the way to becoming the biggest faction they have ended the debate on their terms. The old guard will remain and the strategies mastered during the Mingang insurrection will be kept. To strengthen themselves even more, they appointed Deng Yanda a general part of the PAC as chief of the army. However, instead of using their newly gained power to reform the army, they set out to finish the economic work started by the opposition. We began by investing into education and revolutionary culture, something that will help us in the long term. Part of the revolutionary culture was to encourage the feminist struggle and pave the way for an equal society. Actually turning to the economic issues now, we started reconstruction of our eastern and northern territories, those who had been hit hard during the war. We then started discussing land distribution, a hotly debated issue. However, with the political weight behind them, the PAC managed to get through their version of slow land reforms. This allowed us to finally fully recover from the war and we have even come out stronger. However, before we were done, the Qing government, scared of our success, declared war. Luckily, our army had seen this coming and already started preparing. With all our states integrated, the amount of volunteers joining our army has allowed us to expand the width of our divisions and train several more of them. Currently we have 200,000 deployed men, but another 150,000 can be deployed as reserves. Since the Qing forces are winning 3 out of 4 battles, we decided to deploy them and immediately send them to the front. While we stabilized it, we will continue with our military reforms starting with reviving the Military Affairs Commission in order to better command our troops. Looking at the front, the addition of 18 reserve divisions stopped all Qing offensives and allowed us to start our own. Attacking from three sides, the one Qing division had no chance at defending the province. It took however a bit longer for us to capture it since the Qing called in their associated governments in Sichuan and Hunan, who had the division in the area. Nonetheless, the province was captured. We wanted to continue, but the arrival of German East Asian volunteers forced us to halt. To try and take the province back, the Qing launched an all-out offensive in the north. It looked extremely terrifying at first, but we soon realized we had no problems holding them off. Both because our forces are strong and dedicated, but also since Liang Guang clique joined the war on our side, forcing them to divert troops to Hunan. With the front now mostly silent, we can start to prepare our own offensive. Since this is the people's war against an emperor and German imperialism, we will start to encourage the people living under Qing rule to rise up. We had planned to do some more reforms before we would launch our offensive, but with the Fengtian government declaring war on the Qing, we launched our offensive to immediately take advantage of the situation and to seize land before the Japanese puppet take everything. Our plan is to continue in Kaifeng with the goal of capturing the Zhengzhou railway hub to divide Beijing from the rest of the Qing Empire. Simply put, we will conduct a massive encirclement operation.
We have reached Beijing. The northern expedition has been avenged. But the war is still ongoing. While our politicians are proclaiming complete victory already, our generals know better than that. Sadly, our soldiers have become disoriented since some believe victory is ours, but we don't have to worry. The Qing government will soon be destroyed. We started by clearing out the north, which was simple since the disoriented Qing divisions had already begun leaving. We then turned to the south where the Qing supported by German troops had in their panic started an offensive. While it saw some success it left large areas unprotected which was where we staged our own offensive. The first city we captured was Qingyang and from there we continued further south. While we occasionally met strong defenses we could either go around and encircle them or they simply left. Soon we had reached Wuhan state and after a few battles all the major cities were captured. The Qing are now 98% towards capitulation so all we need to do is to capture one single city. The city we set our sight on was all the way up north where everyone was suffering from supply issues. But since we still had better supply we entered the city and the Qing government surrendered. Now we can finally celebrate victory and begin to work to integrate and fix the economy of our newly conquered lands once again. Of course all the warlord states will have to be conquered but this is something our army can focus on alone. While our politicians can hold the second repatriation congress to form the future of our nation. However, before it was held, the Yuan passed a law authorizing the army to deal with the warlords, even those who we aren't at war with. With the whole army now turned east towards the warlords, we prepared an attack in Hunan. Sadly, this led to an unexpected event. The Feng Tiang, furious that we had captured Beijing, declared war and entered the city without resistance, forcing the Second Congress to be halted until we can recapture the city. Luckily, reinforcements from the south rapidly arrived and we immediately tried to take back the city. Unfortunately, the offensive failed, however, the general Ye Ting leading the offensive was struck by an exceptional idea. To deliberately retreat and hide our own numbers, then as they have captured a lot of territory and stretched themselves out, a massive attack will hit them right in the head. Since it's our only chance, we followed the plan and let them march south along the Yellow Sea. While we at first had everything under control, they soon reached the Yellow River and as they started to cross it, we had to launch our attack. With a massive number of troops we punched through their thin lines and arrived to the Yellow Sea encircling the Feng Tiang offensive. What followed was chaotic, we began closing the encirclement while they expanded it. They did capture Yantia and its port, however they couldn't retreat their forces since we cut most of them off. At the same time with their Beijing defenses weakened we started our attack to reclaim the city. After many battles with us winning the majority we at last entered the city allowing us to retry hosting the long awaited congress. But quickly before we do we will decide our next war plans. Fearing that Japan will intervene if we continue winning against Feng Tiang we decided to turn towards the warlords. As you might remember the army was authorized to intervene against the two warlords we aren't at war with. However before we attack them we offered them an alliance. It was worth it since both accepted. The Gui Mingyang since they had been Chiang Kai-shek's allies previously and Liang Guang since they were the only ones supporting our Mingyang insurrection. Finally we could let our army do their job and start the congress. Many things were discussed, how to unite the Chinese people, how to fix our economy and less important issues such as which national anthem should be chosen. What was apparent at the end was that there is so much to be done. We decided to firstly focus on our industry and to raise the legitimacy of our party. The work started with the formation of the National Reconstruction Commission, embarking us on the mission towards rapid modernization. To help it in its work we also created the National Economic Council which is the main body that will decide the way forwards. It was it which decided to start several projects ranging from infrastructure modernization to new factories. Meanwhile reconstruction of Beijing had begun and we changed its name to Beiping to banish its dark history. It was also decided that Puyi the Qing emperor would be banished into exile. 
On the political front, a massive coalition was formed between all parties to safeguard our goals from any dictator. This, together with our strong control over Beijing, allowed us to finally secure foreign recognition from more than just a third international. This, of course, helped our legitimacy. Continuing with economic reforms, most mines around our country were nationalized, and we could focus most revenues on welfare, an important pillar in a socialist economy. While we haven't reached our goal of modernization just yet, we could revitalize our economy and upheave it from its pre-war status by establishing the National Health Administration and putting a lot of money into it. So we could quickly turn away from our economy and instead focus on education by first funding new schools and university to expand our research capabilities. Then we could once again use them to spread our revolutionary culture, which finally made our legitimacy over China total. Turning back to our economy, we started developing heavy industry. Since if we want to reach our goal of 82 factories, we need to hurry up. However, this was the last major economic reform and investment we did because we need to start reforming our army. To be honest, it has done great so far and defeated all warlords. Hunan was, of course, the first to fall, having already lost more than half their territory. But then our army continued in the north by destroying the Ma clique and creating a bigger front against Sichuan. This allowed us to enter Chengdu and Chongqing so that Sichuan surrendered. Lastly, Yunnan was destroyed. So why do we need to reform our army if it clearly works great? Well, since it doesn't, with a bunch of new recruits and old warlord divisions joining our side, our army has become disoriented. So to fix it, we will demobilize the army and build it up from scratch. But this is for the next video, which you don't want to miss. Not only will we reform our army, but Feng Tian must be crushed. There is also a massive threat that has to be dealt with: Japan. With war in Europe, they have expanded their faction to the south and are currently invading German East Asia. We are sure to come next. Thanks so much for watching, and see you in the next video.